Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. It's Friday. The weekend is coming up. Welcome to the show. This is, if you're not familiar with, with, with what we do here, this is where we talk to with entrepreneurs how, about how they're building resilience during this very challenging time. Um, in a moment, we'll, we'll speak with one of them. But before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, 3M, for supporting this series. 3M is using science and innovation to help the world respond to COVID-19. 3M is on track to produce 2 billion respirators globally by the end of this year. In addition, 3M has also maximized production of other solutions, including biopharma filtration, hand sanitizers, and disinfectants. You can learn more at 3M.com slash COVID. Thank you. Okay. My guest today in the window next to me is Aisha Fatima Dozier. Aisha worked in investment banking all around the world for about two decades. And then last year, she founded the global beauty brand Bossy Cosmetics, which she describes as a female empowerment company masquerading as a makeup company. Um, if you listen to How I Built This and you watch the Resilient series, you know how fascinated I am by the cosmetics industry. And I've learned so much about it through guests uh, on the show like, like Aisha. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you for having me. You can't imagine how excited I am to be talking to you. We are so excited, too. If you are watching on Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube or Twitter, um, please um, bring your questions for Aisha. Any questions you have about the cosmetics industry, about entrepreneurship, about whether it's a crazy time to start a business right now and, <laughs> and, and, and so on, please keep them coming. So first, Aisha, tell us about Bossy Cosmetics. Tell us, tell us what, what it is. Sure. No, it's actually an honor and privilege to talk about my company, which I which I do a lot and I love doing. So I um I won't take you on the long journey, but just very short elevator pitches. You know, Bossy Cosmetics exists to ignite confidence in women who self-identify as ambitious. And we do that through high quality makeup, you know, vegan, cruelty-free, paraben-free, clean for you makeup, topical content, again, that really centers around ambitious women and essential services. That's effectively what Bossy Cosmetics does. We're a young brand, less than two years old, and it's been it's been an exciting ride. So so t- I mean. What, what, tell me the story. I mean, you were in yeah. finance. I know you grew yeah. up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you studied at Cornell, and um, and you were in finance for like two decades. How yeah. did you – tell me how, how, the story. How did you make the move to start your own thing? You know, so it's interesting. If I sort of go back, it's important to, to, to mention, you know, I'm a first-generation American citizen. And my parents were or are Nigerian. My father's passed away. And after the war in Nigeria, they moved to the U.S. to get college degrees, both of them, or at least my father did. When my mom got here, she decided she also wanted to get a college degree. I was born in the middle of that process and my parents got a divorce. They split. My father went back to Nigeria and we lived in the U.S. until I was 10. And then I moved back to Nigeria. Now, when I went to Cornell, as you said, I had I didn't I don't think I was passionate about finance. I just knew that I needed to pay for my own education, right? Um, and I also knew that I needed to take up loans and get scholarships and grants, etc. And so I left school with you know quite heavy debt. And you know you just very quickly make the mental calculation and realize finance is where the money is, right? right. So I think I fell into finance, and also I was very good or talented at math. And I was very, very good at economics and sort of one plus one equals this. And how do you think about moving things very quickly? Um, So I was naturally good at it. And when I started at my first job was at Goldman in New York, I thought I would do it for my two years as an analyst. That was it. And then focus on my real passion. And then I was offered a third year analyst position. I said, okay, one year and I'll go to business school. I went to business school. And then after business, you know, I kept saying, one more year, one more year. And, you know, as they say, golden handcuffs, you make yes. more money, you keep getting higher and higher and that whole adrenaline goes. And then you sort of put the passion on the back burner and focus on climbing that ladder. And for me, four years ago, I said, first of all, I fell ill. I was diagnosed with hypertension. I was super stressed out. I have three children. I was traveling all over the world. I was very senior as an investment banker, um, but I wasn't healthy. And when my doctor said, listen, you're going to have a stroke if you keep going this way, for me, it was a come to Jesus moment. 
Um, and that was the beginning of the journey. At the time, I didn't know that I would start a makeup company um, because I, I had no makeup background except for the fact that I was an avid user of yeah. beauty products. So that's where it started from. You know, it's so interesting because we talk about this on the show a lot, this idea of doing things that are dangerous versus scary. And yeah. it sounds like, you know, and, and, and when you have those golden handcuffs, it feels really scary to leave because, yeah. you know, you've got this steady income and you're making lots of money and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a secure job. But then the question is, is it dangerous to stay? Because one day you might wake up and regret that you didn't leap at the chance to do something on your own. And it sounds like that Absolutely. calculation you made, you, you, you realize that Absolutely. it would be too dangerous to stay, even though it yeah. was scary yeah. to leave. Yeah. I mean, I would wake up, I had a panic attack, I'll be honest with you, where I was in the hospital in Lagos, Nigeria, which is where I was living in my last role as the head of investment banking for the West Africa region for a South Africa bank. And when I had decided, okay, I'm quitting, I'm not healthy, I'm certainly not mentally happy doing this job, but I don't know what I want to do. Just the sheer fear. I was so petrified of loss of status, loss of income, you know, that, that business card, your identity has been so wrapped up in this thing. You know, I, I thought I was having a heart attack. Turns out it was a panic attack. And at that point, you know, at the hospital, my husband and I looked at each other and it was just very clear that something needed to change. So really it took a lot of courage for you to do this. Um, and, and yeah, so let's talk about Let's talk about makeup and cosmetics because, yeah. you know, and, and, and people in your industry know this is a massive global industry with yeah. huge growth potential. We've done a lot of cosmetics brands on how I built this. On Monday, by the way, we have a new episode coming out about Lush Cosmetics. Um, oh, wow. How, 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 did you, how did you decide to focus on cosmetics, on, on creating a cosmetics brand? So when I left my job in banking, um, I, I was thankfully um, accepted into a fellowship at Stanford. So that's how I came to Palo Alto, which is where I live right now. I was a part of a fellowship, a one-year fellowship called the Distinguished Careers Institute. And what I love about the DCI fellowship is they take people who have established some level of success in their careers, but are looking for significance, right? And that was exactly where I was, which was, okay, I, you know, obviously I'm not, I don't want to I need to make money to continue living, but I didn't want financial gratification to be my goal any longer. I wanted to really, I felt that over 20 some odd years, I had developed so many different skills that I wasn't using appropriately, right? I was just using in board meetings or pitch meetings and M&A deals. And I felt like that was a well-oiled machine that didn't really need me and I wasn't using my calling. And so I spent one year at Stanford. Most of my time was in the design school which was probably one of the most transformational years for me because the main thing I learned was you can actually do anything you want to do. You don't have to have all the information. Just give it a try, right? Have an insight, go out there, test it in the marketplace, create a prototype, go out there, engage with customers, have a very empathetic view of what you're doing, and then just go back. Keep reiterating and keep reiterating. And so I was like, wait a minute. I don't have to have millions of dollars to create a massive company and then go into the marketplace to learn. I can just take little steps and little steps. And so that freed me of years of servicing major global corporates who you don't really know exactly how they start, but then there are billions of dollars of net income. Right. And so you only see the big corporate. And I realized, wait a second, that's a 20-year journey. Day one journey can literally be start really small. Yeah. And so once I had that freedom guy, I knew that I could do anything. And then I said to myself, I asked myself a very simple question. What if you did not have to work for money? What if you could do anything that you wanted to do, you weren't afraid, and you didn't have to worry about being financially imperiled? And I immediately knew I wanted to do something with color. If you can see we're in my office, it's very colorful here. Uh -huh. I wanted to do something with color, and I wanted to do something with women. I, was, I, I had learned over the years that ambitious women who, who, like myself, climb the ladder often deal with issues around imposter syndrome, deal with issues of lack of confidence, even though we don't show it, but inside we're shaking, right? And I felt like that confidence hack 
was super important for women to take them to the next level. And I wanted to drill into that. That was my insight. And so I started talking to women. How do you think about confidence? What do you do? What do you do to get ready for this big meeting or promotion or job interview? And so many women talked about, I get my hair done. I put on my makeup. I put on my lipstick. I da, 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 da. And there was this connection between how you look, how you feel, and how you perform. And that's where I was like, let's go. I'm going to start a beauty company. And it was, I'll just pick one thing and I'll test it. And if it fails, it's so low risk. I won't do it anymore. I'll find something else. And then it just started like, oh, people like this product. People like this insight. People like that we're doing this content around it. People like the fact that we offer free coaching, executive coaching services. Like it just started to take a life on its own. And wow. here we are today. You know, I, I, I mean, the, I, I, the concept is so, and it's, it's, and I've heard this before from other founders who are involved in the beauty industry, which is um, this very simple idea that it's, it, it's incredibly empowering. You know, when, when somebody feels good about the way they look, right. I'm, I'm, I didn't invent this. I do my hair toss, check my nails, baby, how you feeling? Right? Yeah. So, so, right. I mean, um, Jen Hyman of Rent the Runway, this is her whole point is that when, when people yes. feel when they look good, when they feel good, they're more confident, they're empowered, and it actually enables women to feel powerful in, in, in the workplace. And it sounds like that's the, that's the that sort of value proposition you landed on. Absolutely. Our, our mission statement from day one, it's on our site, is empowering women to look, feel, and do good. And that, and it's, it's really when you, when people say, you know, what's your why, you know, I'm obsessed with Simon Sinek's, you know, following your why. And that is always my why. My why of this company is, you know, really making, helping women to feel very empowered around their looks, but more importantly, how they feel so that they can do like the do is the action. And that's where we are. And so your earlier point about, you know, we are really a women's empowerment mission driven brand that masquerades as a beauty brand. That's exactly the core of what Bossy Cosmetics is. It's about wanting women to go out and do more, be more. We're taking questions for Aisha Dozier um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, YouTube, however you're watching. So please keep them coming. All right. So you land on this idea during this year. You have no background in cosmetics and makeup, but you know that yeah. that you can start small. So yeah. how did you start? Did you just start to really dive into the research and and start to really delve into this in, into this industry to learn as much as you could? Absolutely. So the first thing I did, I was still a student at the time. So the benefit of being a student at Stanford is you have access to Euromonitor reports and all these various research reports, McKinsey reports, all sorts. So of course, being a student at the time, I just studied. I started, I started analyzing research reports, Euromonitor reports, you know, industry analyst reports, of course, being a former investment banker, you know, I just read and read and read. I read beauty publications, what's in, what's topical, what's out. Um, and then the first, the, one of the most important things I learned was that the average woman wears something color on her lips, right? She always does, right? On most occasions, but she is least loyal to the person who makes her lipstick. Like the average woman who wears makeup is very religious about the foundation she wears or the eyeliner or the mascara. Like she'll have one product that she's like, this is the, my one thing, but for lipsticks, she'll have 10. Huh. And she'll try, she'll have 10 different reds, four different purples and different colors. That was the area with the least amount of customer loyalty, brand loyalty. And that's where I was like, you need to start in lips because I'm not a celebrity. I'm not an influencer. Nobody knows who I am. But if that's the area which people are willing to try, then that's where you need to go. So that's how I started with lipsticks. Right. Wow. You know, I've noticed, by the way, I mean, it's obviously not a huge, huge trend yet, but I was watching a. Uh, BTS on Jimmy Fallon this week. They've been on Jimmy Fallon. Okay. The, and yeah. this is the biggest band in the world. They all wear yeah. lipstick. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's amazing. I mean, I was a huge, or still am, a huge lipstick user, right? And it was actually a very community tribe driven experience for me. And that my friends and I, you know, I travel a lot for work. 
And I would say to my friend, hey, I'm at the airport. I saw this beautiful red lipstick that just came out by Givenchy. I'll buy five. Uh And I would send them all to my friends when I get home, right? Or my friends would say, there's this new Fenty lip gloss. You know, it's going to be perfect on you. I'll buy you a purple. I'll get a brown. I'll get this. And a lot of women do that, like share ideas around makeup or send each other pictures. I'm going to this board meeting. Should I wear red? Should I wear purple? It's a really big thing. And it's not frivolous, right? It's like women. Women like myself with with real careers wear makeup. And 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 this notion that beauty is for like frivolous women is silly. It's not true. It's a massive $600 billion industry that is growing. Yeah. So when you decided to take the leap, um, did you go out and seek funding for the business? Ooh, I did. So first of all, I'll say that. I wanted to start small, but of course I live in Palo Alto and you kind of have this notion that, wait a minute, everybody who wants to start a business here just, you know, has checks written to them, right? And so you're like, oh, okay, well, if I want to start small, I'll get somebody to write me a check. So I wrote this, I've been an investment banker, I know how to write decks, so I write this really nice deck. (laughs) And I go, you know, trying to speak to venture capitalists, of course I do a bunch of blind emails, and... I don't think anybody responded to any of my blind emails. And I sent a lot. And I sent several repeatedly. I'm not sure anybody responded to any of them. Um, And then I went through sort of my Harvard Business School network. And everybody that I spoke to made me hate the idea. Wow. They said, don't do it. So I'll give you the, it it was a range. It was, this is not a great idea. Um, Who, lipstick, like... Oh, people were telling you that your idea wasn't a good idea? Oh, absolutely. A lot of people said to me, men, by the way, said to me, what is the connection between work and beauty? The two have nothing to do with (laughs) each other. Um, They're not listening to how I built this if they're saying that, by the way. Clearly not, right? And and that's the thing is like, it's pointless to even continue a conversation when you're speaking to a potential investor who doesn't even understand your industry. Or the one of the most offensive was, this is so niche. You know, this is only for black women, right? And there was that sort of underlying um, unconscious or maybe conscious bias of yeah. because I'm black, the only woman I can really appeal to with my product and my marketing, um, you know, point is is another black woman, right? So it was this is too niche or this isn't a real thing or people aren't wearing makeup anymore. You know, just some really silly things that that led me to, okay, you know, let's stop this. Just self-finance. And I have to be honest that, you know, I am privileged that I could do that. Um, um, And I had a few friends who were like, hey, we want to support you and wrote me checks. And I started on my own, right? So no institutional money. And I said, let's just start this and see, right? Because, you know, we'll go, we'll go from where it starts from. And one of the blessings I do have to say, although it's not so much a blessing any longer, is not having any institutional capital makes you super scrappy, makes you think about every cent you spend and whether, what is, what is the potential return on this and is it useful? But then you also So remember your design element, which is I've got to keep tinkering. I've got to keep experimenting. So it was a really interesting place to find myself, which is I really did think, oh, my God, I'm Aisha. I should be able to raise lots of money. And then realizing that I can't raise any. (laughs) And so I just, you know, when I have a really passionate idea in my head, I go with it. And the thing that really excited me was when I spoke to women. They would all say to me, oh, my God, that's a great idea. How come nobody's doing that? Oh, my God, that's cool. Like, you're going to offer free coaching services? How are you going to make money from that? Oh, wait, you're going to interview women to talk about this? You're going to do that? You're going to do that? And that's when I was like, wait, my customer likes this. So let's just focus on the customer. And so that's that was the blessing in the rejections, is that it forced me to focus on the ultimate user. Um. I mean, essentially, what you are creating is a media company, but also a company that that makes products. It's 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 cosmetics, but it's also coaching and and a blog and a, and sort of right. I mean, there's lots yeah. of offerings yeah. there. By the way, um, one of the cool things about the cosmetics industry is that I think 20 years ago, the barrier to entry was very high because it required a lot of upfront capital. And yeah. but today, there are ways to do it that are um, less, you know, less kind of onerous, right? Because yeah. 
there are manufacturers all over the United States that yeah. well, essentially you go to them and say, these are the ingredients I want. This is what I want it to be. And they, yeah. they can make it for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All over the world. And so, you know, you can literally, I mean, if you can find somebody who can make you 20 lipsticks for you to start selling, you can do that. And let me tell you that that's, don't be embarrassed by that. Get on Instagram. You know, we have never had a lower, lower barrier to entry to starting as an entrepreneur today. You know, it's free to set up an Instagram account. It's really easy to set up a bank account, like all these things, create a really tiny product range. You can even shoot the photography yourself if you want to with an iPhone and just go out there and give it a try. And, and I really do believe, which is something we've been doing at Bossy, is you just keep getting better and better. Like you improve, you improve, you improve, you improve. Yeah. I um, Tell me about the name. I mean, it's so <laughs> great because it's so like in your face, but it's, it's yeah. clearly tongue in cheek, but also has a has a multiple meanings. So tell me about it the does. name. Why, why Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> there's a good and there's a good and, and not so great part of the name. So when I was thinking, so when I had come to this, okay, I'm going to start a, a beauty company. I thought, what should I call it? And literally bossy hit me in the, in the face. Right. And I thought I, what I want to use with bossy is I want to, it is the word for me that really encapsulated the kind of woman I was trying to speak to. And when I say self-identifies as ambitious, she more than likely at least once in her entire life has been called bossy. And, and that was always, and I definitely have been called bossy multiple times in my life, right? And what that meant was, you know, whether it's in the fourth grade, when some kid in your class is like, oh my God, you're so bossy. But what it is, is you have a viewpoint and you want to make your point heard. And the other kid is like, oh, shut up. You're so bossy because you're a girl. Or even as an adult, right, where you're in a meeting and you're really trying to take control of things and someone thinks that you're too, especially if you're a woman, you know, they call us aggressive or they call, you know, they don't say you're assertive or you're a natural leader. And so I wanted to take this term that has historically been used in a very pejorative fashion for women and say and, and almost flip it on its head and say, ladies, if you, you know, own this, own your bossy, let's retake this term and let's use it to empower ourselves that when someone calls you bossy, it means they heard your voice, right? Because if you're a wilting flower in the corner, no one's calling you bossy. So that's that's how I picked the name yeah. um, with Bossy. And it's funny because now, I, you know, we've been around for, like I said, 19 months or 20 months. I've lost count. Sometimes it feels like 19 years and sometimes it feels like 19 days. Yeah. Um, but there's so many different Bossies in the beauty industry now. I mean, you've got we're Bossy Beauty or Bossy Cosmetics. There's so many different versions. Be Bossy, Bossy this, Bossy that. And so, you know, we are in the process of, of now growing our business. And when you and I talk about, you know, what's been going on in the last few months, we're actually going through the process of rebranding the company. Oh, really? Um, so we are. So we will always keep that bossy essence. But um, we are rebranding the company because it's impossible to get a trademark with the word bossy yeah, now in I'm the United sure. States because... You know, there are at least 20 companies that use the word bossy. And of course, being a former banker, I understand, you know, ownership of, of IP. And so that is very critical for us. So it's a very interesting time for the business and growth perspective as can well. You re can, you, can you call it like B-A-W-S-Y? Like boss, spell it differently. You know, <laughs> I'd love to do that, but I promise you, somebody will find a reason to sue us. <laughs> it has been a very interesting few months, guy, with um, you know, ambulance chasers and yeah, people, sure. you know, believing that they own that word, and you know, just my own personal search of, you know, in the last six months, our business has exploded. Really? And um, yeah, it has. And, yeah, tell, and, tell, let's talk about that. I mean, I mean, you're a new business, so you're so so yeah. you're and and you're in the midst of this economic and and, and global health crisis. So, yeah. tell me what's been going on with the business. Yeah. So, I guess in January, I started to get really nervous, and the reason is when we first started the business, 100 percent of our supply chain was in California. And then, of course, as we started to grow and I decided, okay, look, this is actually going really well. I want to go into eyeliners, eyeshadows, all these. I want to get into full color cosmetics. Um, I decided that I would diversify my supply chain. 
right? Um, and so I went on this trip last summer with my product designer who's based in Paris, and we, you know, met lots of different labs and in the end picked a, a really beautiful global supply chain of folks who have doing, been doing this for generations. So we moved our formulation lab to Italy. Um, our primary packaging suppliers are in China, um, and then our boxing packaging is in Germany and had really expert folks working on it. Well, of course, as we all know now, in January, this flu started to go around, um, which those of us in America didn't think it was a big deal, but it was a big deal for me because by March 8th was our first year birthday. And on March 8th, I was going to be unveiling a whole new collection, you know, with just everything, eyeshadows, eye, all this beautiful stuff, really beautifully packaged. The woman who, you know, redesigned our logo and our product packaging worked for Lancôme and Givenchy for many years. I mean, we were going to take it out, guy. And then in January, my suppliers are like, yeah, we don't know. Um, we might have to close for just a week or just two weeks. And then it became February. They were shut down. I started to have panic. I was like, okay, we need to get this out. Let's get that out. And they managed to get one container out to Italy. And so I'm like, okay, thank God. Our stuff is getting to Italy. At least half of it's getting to Italy. If we rush by March, we can launch some of them, not all of them. And then, as we all know, Italy shut down. Yeah. So by my one first anniversary, March 8th, I had a good problem, which is that our launch collection had pretty much sold out, right? Which was great, but I had nothing else to sell. So there was like sold out, sold out on the website, you know, all my promises and announcements of, oh, guys, you know, we have this coming out. We're just, I had nothing to sell. I was literally, I, I was miserable. <laughs> and so that happened in March and I just eventually said to myself listen there's a global pandemic out of my hands you know I've got to also focus on my kids now because they're not in school I have no product to sell so I don't have time to think about this business right really um, and then what happened was really interesting in that in April, I sent an email out to our email list of a, of a few thousand people. And I said, guys, look, I feel really bad, Lee, that you haven't heard from me. But, you know, this is what's – and I was honest. You know, I'm really sorry that everything is sold out on the site. I have nothing to sell you. At this point now, my, my California supplier is also shut down. So there's nothing to sell. And I'm like, look, there's nothing to sell, guys. But, you know, can I offer – can we chat? Can we talk? If anybody wants to talk about getting an MBA, I have an MBA. I'd love to give you advice about that. If anybody wants to talk about how to be a mom in these times, I would love to talk about that. And my customers started writing me back. Aisha, can you talk about this? Can we do this? Can you do an IG Live on this topic? Can you do this? Can you do that? And it became this whole community discussion huh. that had nothing to do with selling product. Yeah. And so that just kept me busy. And then June happened. And of course, we know what happened in June. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I feel really weird, Guy, talking about the death of George Floyd because, I mean, for the obvious reasons, yeah. um, you know, just a very broken period and a very sad period. But what happened for Black-owned businesses was, you know, and I don't know if it was guilt. I don't really know what it was. But we, I, I, I was, I was overwhelmed with orders. I was overwhelmed with orders, overwhelmed with attention. You know, it was almost like someone had switched the coding and the algorithm where, um, you know, traditionally you needed millions of dollars to apply to digital marketing so that your brand can be seen or advertising or whatever. And I didn't have millions of dollars. Um, but what, what happened in June was that the algorithm changed and folks started looking for quality Black-owned businesses. And the press started to really talk about us. And then the people who just didn't even know about my business before did. And luckily at that time, Italy opened up again. China had opened up again. And so I flew out an aircraft of some of our products that were made. Wow. And I was like, let's go. Um, and so, yeah, we still don't have everything. Um, but it all kind of happened at a very interesting time. And so we're, we're back in business. And with this whole 15% pledge, that's opened up a whole new thing for us. This as is well. the, um, what Sephora and some of these beauty retailers are saying, 15% of yeah. the products we sell will be, will be by, by black owned businesses. Exactly. Yeah. And so not only did you have consumers now 
you know, looking for black owned brands, buying them, trying them on, word of mouth spreading, people sending you pictures, you know, I'm at home on a Zoom call, but look at me and your product, you know, just really exciting, exciting, just, you know, beautiful growth and stories. Then you have, you know, major retailers who are emailing you, you know, you look in your email box and you're like, huh? Like what me? Wow. And they're like, yeah, we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to, can we, you know, we'd love to talk to you about getting in our store. And, you know, I started off this year, I think I did an IG live where I said by the end of 2020, I would love to be in five boutiques. And I had picked five cities, LA, New York, like DC, you know, just little boutiques where yeah. I thought my customer was shopping. And then all of a sudden I get national global Sorry, wow. uh, sorry, Siri interrupting. Um, then all of a sudden you have um, global retailers emailing you saying, hey, we'd love to talk to you. We're thinking about signing on to this 15% pledge. You know, some customers have suggested you. Let's talk. So it's, you know, in, in March when I kind of fell on the floor like, oh, my God, my business yeah. is dead to today. I can't believe it. I mean, it really is. A reminder that in those low moments, sometimes you just have to like get through it. You just have to kind of persevere. And the only way to get through it is just to get through it because it. around the corner, something may happen that may completely change the situation. I am a testament to that. I mean, yeah. I literally in April thought the business is dead, right? Like how do you have a, a, a product company that doesn't have products and yeah. doesn't know when it's going to have products. And is this even a good use of your time? The world is falling apart. Is the world coming to an end? And then, I mean, wow. I mean, key, I mean now I get this point about resilience. Now I get this point around grit. Yeah. Do you have one, 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 one last question for you before we go? Um, you know, this is such a crazy time. I mean, you're you're still early on in building your yeah. business and, and building the foundation of your business. But in, I mean, if you were starting out, if you if somebody came to you and said, you know, Aisha, I don't, I mean, is now a good time to start a business? Like the world is crazy. Like what 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 should I do? What 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 would you answer? How do you how do you answer that question? I would say yes, actually. Um, look, I mean, it depends obviously on your circumstance, right? Because I think I am, uh, you know, I am lucky that I'm blessed that I have a home to live in and that, you know, I can afford to take this type of risk. So I think, first of all, people need to establish whether they are, what kind of privilege they enjoy to allow themselves to not have a salary because, you know, you don't pay yourself money when you're starting this business. Every cent goes back into the company. So once I'm assuming you've done that, I think this is a really great time. There, there's there are funds outside, out, out there, there are grants, you know, looking for entrepreneurs to do really interesting things. And these are really crazy times where people have needs. People are spending money or are looking for support. You just need to figure out what they want. Um, and so I think that this is, and lots of, as you have said on your podcast, really amazing businesses have started in the most challenging of times. And so this is the time, if you think that you want to be an entrepreneur, this is the time to go for it. Aisha Dozier, founder of Bossy Cosmetics. Thank you so much for, for being on the show, for joining us. Thank you so much, Guy. I enjoyed this conversation. As you know, I'm a massive fan of your podcast and you and now your book. So it's really great to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, because I know we first spoke in, in I think, in May, April or May, actually, on the phone. Yes. So it's so great having you on. Um, just really quickly before we go, um, thank you, uh, everybody watching. Watching. Uh, we've got uh, Moriam Atun uh, At Atinuke. Oshodi, who says Nigerian Americans represent. So hello, thing. Daniel uh, Toro from Indonesia watching. Maria Stella watching says she loves your story. Thank you for what you do. Um, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, on on Tuesday, I'm gonna have the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, Sint Marshall, on the show. Um, and on Monday, as I mentioned briefly, we've got a new episode. It's Lush Cosmetics. So it's nice. such a cool story. It is such a hero's journey. I mean. Mark Constantine was homeless, like he was broke, he wow. made money, he lost it all. It's such a cool story. And if you know Lush Cosmetics, um, 
you will, even if you don't let, know Lush Cosmetics, you will love this story. It is such a cool founder story. Check it out. Um, a reminder, uh, this book is out. Aisha, thank you for for supporting us and for um, endorsing it. Book is out now. Um, you can get it wherever books are sold. And um, check it out. Um, I, I think awesome. it's going to be really useful for you, especially if you're thinking about starting something now. So we'll see you back here next Tuesday. Have a great weekend. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Aisha, I'm sure we'll, we'll speak again. I'm sure we will. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.